sort of those aspects of the system that most of us are, you know, probably more intimately familiar with than some of maybe the science, you know, that we've talked about with organic. Um, first cultural practices, mowing practices. I mentioned that the uh, genetics of the grass determines ultimately the mowing height. So for cool season grasses, the stress-free height is three inches. So then it, you know, people always ask me, well, if three is good for tall fescue, is four better? Um, there's a point when you can leave it too long and, and things don't happen properly. So we don't want to think that, you know, if, if we're trying to manage it at three, that if we go to four or four and a half, uh, in the middle of the summer down here, in the hot summer, if we're managing a fescue lawn, it certainly wouldn't hurt to go up close to four. But then at some point uh, in uh, September when the weather, you know, begins to moderate, it probably is best served to come back closer to, closer to three. Uh, and again, with fescue and with all grasses, there's a direct relationship to, you know, height of cut and that horizontal extension. And that's what I look at as being the most important. If I no longer have those herbicides to use and I can't mitigate weed pressures that way, then I have to rely on some other strategies to do that. I mean, we do have, there are some products that are coming out that, you know, are compliant, you know, with the statute uh, for weed mitigation, but they're not as effective probably as the manufacturers want. There's one that's based on a chelated iron. There's another one that's based on a mineral salt-based product. Uh, both of them, they, they individually, they're okay. Um, I've actually worked with them and tank mixed the two materials, which is a, a legal tank mix, and I've gotten outstanding results uh, on a spot treatment basis. They're cost prohibitive to the point that not going to use them on a on a soccer field uh, because you'd be looking at you know a huge price tag in order to do that but for taking out clover for taking out uh, you know some of the other broadleafed weeds a tank mix of this mineral salt and this chelated iron uh with with a couple of sprays is is pretty effective and I'll show you some pictures on on uh, on some of the trials where we did the work on that um, cultural practices, so mowing, uh, sharp mower blades goes without saying. Uh, a dull mower rips and tears the, the blade, an ideal site for fungal infection. So when we're trying to make sure that we don't get fungal issues happening, then, you know, we end up, you know, wanting that good sharp cut because it heals itself over. Uh, speaking of fungal issues, one of the things in a short, relatively short day like this, I mean, when I do these uh, very comprehensive training, it's two, two and a half days of all of this. So it's really uh, like a lot of classroom time and then a lot of interacting time. So there won't be not a whole lot of time to go through all of the insect, weed, and disease discussion that goes along with organic management. And I do just want to stress that, you know, we do focus on insect weeds and disease as you know for both management and then the practical application if we need to intervene during a transition period with allowed materials I'm going to touch on that um, and I certainly would make myself available to anybody here uh, to pursue that on an individual basis you can certainly email me and contact me my contact information is here um, and discuss you know the specifics on product and, and, and the wide range of product that's available for an insecticide that's allowed. Uh, there are new fungicides now that have turf registration and they're what they, they fall into the range of what we call biorational materials. Biorational meaning they have their origins in nature, specifically with microbial. Uh, there's, a, there's an OMRI approved uh, organic, Jay uh, Feldman referred to this, Organic Materials Review Institute approved. Uh, where we have a, a bacillus uh, organism, a bacillus subtilis, that is a wonderful insecticide. Uh, it's effective against grubs. It's effective against uh, turf insects. Uh, it's also effective in ornamentals and roses and things like aphids and, and like that. So the, the, the development, there are companies now that are working to develop this range of biorational materials 
that uh, they still contain inert ingredients, but they're inert ingredients that are not of toxicological concern and that are approved by the Organic Materials Review Institute. So, uh, you know, again, any of that sort of specific issue, more than happy to work with any of you on an ongoing basis to avail you, you know, of some of these newer materials that you, you know, may not have heard of. Uh, generally, when we're cutting grass, we're trying to remove one, in, one third of the blade at any one given time. Uh, as I said, we j should be mulching them, right, returning them into the turf system. So we always want to leave them there. Uh, cool season recommendation here. Uh, this is a fescue recommendation. Uh, first mowing in the spring, we're going to take it down to two inches to remove any overwintering uh, fungus. If there is any evidence of winter fungal pressures evident, we probably do want to bag and remove these clippings. During the growing season, we're going to gradually raise the height somewhere in that three inch range, highest throughout the heat of the summer. Um, we, when we overseed a turf system, generally I'm recommending that if we have bare spots or thin spots in the spring, you want to fill them with some grass seed before weeds get to be an issue. Uh, not that we necessarily are going to overseed the entire lawn at that point in time, but that we do want to attack problem areas at that point in time. If we are managing sports turf or parks where people are using it heavily, uh, the optimum time to do a comprehensive overseeding, especially on sports turf, is, the, is uh, early June down here, early to middle of June, because in September, these fields are under full play, and it's uh, hard to do it even though we do do it. Uh, we also do sports turf in, in September. We let kids sort of work it in with their cleats or their shoes, sneakers, um, you know, and get it into the system that way. Residential, uh, if we are doing warm, uh, cool season fescues, uh, early September is the optimum time to do overseeding. Uh, Bermudas in warm season, everything backs up earlier in the season, remembering that those systems are going to approach dormancy uh, by the time that we get to mid-fall. If we are overseeding uh, residential turf in early September, you want to cut the grass to two inches in order to do that. It would be very difficult, if not impossible, to try to germinate grass seed at a three inch height of cut if we're leaving the fescue up to three inches because grass seed needs light to germinate. So light temperature and moisture all to germinate. So if we have a three inch height of cut, if we are trying to mitigate crabgrass pressures, then three inches, I'll show you a case study where you know we successfully did that, but we were keeping the height at three inches. Uh, I, there, was a, there was a new, uh, there's a new uh, product being developed, a new biological for a pre-emergent crabgrass control. It's not in the market yet. It's in the research and development stage coming out of Canada. And it's a, it's a biological organism that is um, trying to be developed for pre-emergent crabgrass control. So there were four people in the United States got six ounces of this material last spring to play with, and I was one. And so it's very specific on timing and soil temperature. And in the cool season turf, soil temperature had to be 60 degrees. And you put it down. And then 30 days later, you repeated the application. And then it was monitoring the system. So I did everything by the manufacturer's recommendation and based on all of his research. And then I started to get a phone call in early June. How much crabgrass do you have? And I said, I don't have any crabgrass. And I had a 1,000-square-foot trial site. And so I was able to divide it completely in half and have a control and then a treated area. And I had not heavy crabgrass on this trial site. It was part of a crabgrass uh, remediation trial I was doing. So I still had some. I hadn't taken the whole process towards completion yet. And so uh, early June, no crabgrass. So then the, the third week of June, they called me back. I said, I don't have any crabgrass. And then about the 5th, 6th, 7th of July, they called me back, and I said, I don't have any crabgrass. And they said, well, crabgrass is all over the Northeast. And, and so then uh, you know, he was thinking that his product was working, and so I wasn't completely convinced. So I was managing this trial site, and it was part, as I said, of a 14-month crabgrass mitigation study, and I was maintaining it at three inches. Now, three inches robs that 
soil surface of the intensity of light sufficient enough to germinate crabgrass. So the three inch height of cut becomes an herbicide for me because it's not letting sun germinate it. So I went out on the 8th or 9th of July and I set my mower blades to two inches and it was 80 odd degrees, 85 degrees, and I went from three inches to two inches and cut this whole system down. Three days later, I had crabgrass. So my system was keeping the crab, prior to me dropping the mower blade to two inches, there was, you could not find a blade of crabgrass on this system. So then I lowered the mowing height and I cut everything at two inches and all of a sudden crabgrass sprung up on both my control and my treated area. So the message to him was there was probably some benefit from your material, but it was not sure-fired. It did not eradicate. It did not make that symptom go away. So what did make it go away was the system that I had created. So I had that, had I gone through, I could have gone all the way through the rest of that year with no crabgrass manifesting itself if I had kept it at three inches. But by breaking the rules, cutting, changing the system, allowing light intensity down there, I flushed out that crabgrass and then was able to actually photograph and count, you know, the implication. So that's the same message here with overseeding in the fall. If I have a three inch lawn and I put fescue seed on there, I'm not going to get any germination whatsoever. So in September, at some point when temperature becomes cool enough down here to seed with fescue, you want to cut it back to two inches because in the fall, as days get shorter and nights get cooler, weed seed, annual weed seed will no longer germinate because it doesn't have the genetics to do that. Annual weed seed, there's cool season and warm season annual. Warm season annual weed seed will not germinate in the fall on short days. So we cut it, we overseed it, we, as soon as we get germination and establishment, then we gradually allow that turf system to come back up to three inches. What happens in that four or five week period of going from three to two in September with cool season grasses is the grass plant knows, understands that it needs so many cubic centimeters of blade to expose to the sun to photosynthesize properly. And if you cut it and you remove blade tissue, the plant goes into overtime mode to reproduce itself because it's trying to get back its mass. It's trying to get back, back its physical mass to undergo photosynthesis. So that's a strategy for quickly thickening an organic lawn with a long-term eye towards weed suppression is that in that September time frame, reducing the height, stimulating with fertilizer, stimulating with soil building materials, introducing grass seed, germinating the new grass seed, and then rapidly trying to reproduce and thicken the existing lawn. So you've got a couple of different things happening. Uh, the final cut in the fall, we take back to, you know, somewhere between two, two and a half inches. We talk about higher mowing heights, and again, this is based on the genetic. I'm not going to tell you to mow Bermuda grass. I'm not going to say take Bermuda grass to three and a half inches. So we just, we know, that understood that, you know, the, the, the genetics of the grass determine how we mow. Uh, avoid scalping, uh, longer blade, deeper root system, better photosynthesis, deeper roots, more drought resistance, drought tolerance. That's what the fescues are best known for. Uh, clippings don't cause thatch. Thatch is something else entirely. But if you have an existing thatch problem that has been untreated, uh, adding clippings on top of it will make it worse because clippings are broken down by saprophytic organisms in the soil. So the clipping needs to come in contact with the soil. If you have this thick layer of thatch, and it's actually microbes that dissolve or break down thatch. So lots of years of synthetic salt-based fertilizers compromise microbes. Thatch doesn't get broken down on a regular basis. Thatch layers build up, and problems can arise. Um, this is a root-to-shoot ratio. So generally speaking, on the left is the shorter mown conventional management. On the right, natural management. That being said, I can take a bent grass golf course green and cut it to 3 sixteenths of an inch and get a substantial root system. Again, it's genetics. But generally speaking, the amount of tissue mass below the ground has a distinct relationship with the tissue mass that is above the ground. Irrigation, water. More often, it's too much of a good thing. 
uh, people tend to think that water equals kindness to plant material. And in some, some respect, that's accurate. But in a lot of respects, it's not. Water can be problematic to certain crops, and grass is one. Grass does not need lots of water. So there's a, the, you know, down here, you know, you have, you know, the end of March and April, May and June, you got something going on. July and August, something different's going on. September, October, November, something else different's going on, weather-wise, temperature-wise. So there's a different, you know, different ways to water. But to introduce in the spring and fall lots of water is problematic. Um, you know, I've been... Uh, as, as a horticulturist, you know, as, as a grower, I used to be able to take these tiny little plants and grow these big specimen, you know, moss baskets, big fancy things. I remember once selling one to a customer, and it's big, you're saying, you know, big money, and, uh, and said, water this once, put it, put it in this location and water it twice a week. And she brought it back to me eight or nine days later, dead as a doornail. And I said, what did you do? He said, well, I put it right where you told me. I said, but how often do you water it? She said, I watered it every day. And I said, but I told you twice a week. And she said, well, I thought if twice a week was good, every day would be better. <laughs> that's really the, av that's the mentality of the average homeowner out there. Unless you're a landscape professional that also controls the irrigation or installs the irrigation, we know that irrigation companies that strictly do irrigation and don't manage landscapes don't have a, they can't grow a bean in a glass of water. So what do they do? They put in an irrigation system and they program the clock to come on three times a week for 15 minutes a zone probably the worst thing that you can do on irrigation management. And so I've always been an advocate that the landscape professional takes over the irrigation. Because if you're managing the landscape, you've got to know what's going on for water. So the bottom line is that in this region of the country, in the spring and the fall, grass at the very most needs an inch of water a week. Obviously, if we get to the heat of the summer, we're going to bump that up to two inches or so. Uh, you know, and then we also have, if it's, if it's a sports turf or something, we actually syringe where we turn water on at noontime to come on for five minutes, and they're doing nothing more than just cooling that system down, you know, from high heat days. One inch of water will penetrate sand a foot. It'll penetrate a sandy loam eight inches, and it'll penetrate a clay loam six inches. So we end up knowing that soil texture has a big influence on how well water can go down there. Deep, thorough irrigations are far more preferable than repeated shallow. Repeated shallow irrigations end up with short root systems and fungal disease. And so that's one of the, that's one of the downsides. So now if we're in a program where many of these conventional fungicides are off the table, we've got to get a handle on what it is that actually causes the fungal disease. So we know this is a fungal disease triangle. So you need, a tr you need three things. You need a host plant, which is the grass. You need a fungal pathogen. And you need a film of moisture. The fourth dimension to all of that is time, minimum of 12 hours. So 12 hours on the right temperature, the right moisture, and the right host plant, and you could have a problem. So now we try to get a handle on the irrigation side of things so that we can head that off at the pass. Yes, we can build this biologically active soil. We can have this introduction of trichoderma fungus. We can put these beneficials in there or encourage the growth of these beneficials that will suppress most turf grass fungal pathogens. But it also takes the addition of strategies to make sure that everything culturally is happening the right way. I can honestly stand here and tell you that in all the years of managing turf systems, both large and small, organically, I can count probably on four fingers the times we've had to struggle with fungal disease. And those have been in transitional systems where we don't have the organic foundation in place. Fungal disease of turf, once you get a, an organic system in place, become rare. Uh, and, and really aren't much of a problem. The two things that I can give you confidence that, that take care of themselves sooner rather than later are surface grazing insects and fungal disease. So damage from the chewing insects at the surface. The organic system has a way of bringing that checks and balances under control. Not to say that there's, there can't be you know, an outbreak or an issue, because there always can. I mentioned that. So the problem's going to rise in any situation. But you know, grub as a root feeder 
and you know, you hear people all the time say, well, if you have a good organic system, you're never going to get grubs. You know, the organic system will take care of grubs. Don't believe a word of it. I've created some of the best organic soil systems in the world and still gotten grubs. But what doesn't happen is widespread devastation. So it's, it's very localized. So the beetle can come and lay its egg. When we understand how this all works with grubs, it's, 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 a, it's a beetle, and the adult female beetle mates and then lays eggs, and it, it travels. We, we know this. This is, a, this is sort of, I, I, I won't get into too much insect stuff, but this is, I know that the grubs are, are an issue, um, especially with, you know, not having, you know, full range of the imidacloprids and the neonicotinoids and things that may, you know, not be allowed under legislation. But it always was thought that the grub would happen as the whim of wherever the adult decided to lay its eggs, and that's not the case. We, we know that when the beetle emerges from the ground, it flies several miles. When it goes to lay its eggs, it remembers where it came from and comes right back. Rutgers showed this definitively about six, seven years ago. It comes back to its point of emergence from the soil. So it comes back to lay its eggs. So in other words, if you had a grub problem here this year, you can probably bank on the fact that if you hadn't treated, it's going to be there again next year. So we understand that. But what happens is that when that beetle lay its eggs, if you have this healthy, aggressive biomass down there, when the beetle lays those eggs, they're pretty close to microscopic, and a lot of them end up as food source for the microbial community. They don't just sit there and all emer you know, hatch out and emerge. So when we've had to deal with grub problems on organic turf, it's been like a, a soccer field, but isolated to two, three, four hundred square feet out of 85,000 square feet. Very localized. Is there a problem? Yeah. You know, some cases, a couple cases, it was the roots and then the turf kicked up loose. Others, the turf didn't kick up loose, but it was when the skunks and the raccoons and the crows came in as secondary feeders and did the damage, and the damage was, was noticed. Then, you know, organic controls, and, you know, we have you know, or different organic controls, there's beneficial nematodes, there's a 25B product, clove oil, this new insecticide, this bacillus subtilis, marketed under the name of Grandivo, this OMRI-approved material. So we now are getting materials, there's a new, there's a new BT, uh, BT is bacillus thuringiensis, there is a new BT now that is, uh, again, it's one of these brand new products, and I was one of three people that got 20-pound bags of it last fall to work with. The two new strains of BT, one that'll take care of the adult beetle, one that'll take care of the larval grub stage. So those are in trial and development and research right now. So coming up with a bunch of products, you know, for that kind of a thing. But the idea that grubs can happen, and, and they do happen, but with the organic foundation, with the control products that we have, not something that needs to be thought of as really scary that's going to go out of control and cause widespread devastation. Surface grazing insects, as I say, sort of take care of themselves. Uh, and then, um, you know, fungal, fungal pressures. I mean, I think you can talk to, to any of us that have been managing organically for years. Well, I think 100% will say that rarely do you get a fungal outbreak that you, can't, uh, that you can't deal with. So watering. Watering goes a long way towards everything of keeping the everything from keeping the oxygen in here and not getting waterlogged and, and keeping it aerobic so that the biomass can thrive uh, right down from that excessive water uh, sitting on the root zone you know causing you know uh, decay in the root zone and, and getting into those uh, those issues compaction absolutely uh, hands down the biggest enemy of turf grass. Uh, you could take everything that could be a, present a problem to turf grass, and um, you know compaction is going to be at the top of that list. Uh, you know you have a situation like that. I'm starting to get an idea here that you know this was all fern at one point. People decided to walk through it. Walking creates compaction, so that's how those trails were formed by compacting the soil. You know, getting the oxygen out of there, no longer aerobic, and the turf or the plant material, the desired plant material, in this case a fern, in our case turf grass, begins to shut down and disappear from the system, 
and then in, in a grass system, it's weeds that will proliferate. You know, we have the same thing here. And then you have that dreaded situation up there of that, uh, you know, that which if you're managing an athletic field, this is always our biggest struggle and always our biggest challenge. Now, this is a system that's been managed conventionally because if you look closely in the back of that goal mouth, there's all white clover in there. So this has been treated with selective post-emergent herbicides. So then, you know, we understand that, but we still have the bare spots. Um, you know, common problem. And then we have a situation like that. So do we, are pesticides the difference between one and the other? The first one we looked at was seven days a week, five to seven hours a day. This field here was varsity home games only, used a half a dozen times in the fall. So soil density makes the difference. It's not the chemical application, it's the soil density. You know, I, again, out to Boulder, uh, I was, they, had, they stopped using herbicides in 2003 on one sports complex, and I was on it in 2010, and it was 99.5% weed free, a little bit of clover in left field. And I, it was just unbelievable, pristine. And the only thing, and it wasn't even a high level organic program, but the only thing they did was they aerated every 30 days because they had dedicated equipment, dedicated staff on this dedicated facility. Every 30 day aeration, created that soil that never got, you know, low in oxygen, kept the grass aggressive, and there was zero weed pressure. Now, that's the extreme. I've never met yet I mean, another municipality or school district that can throw that kind of a resource at it because they can't. But that's ultimately the message on what happens there. So when we end up doing that, we end up understanding that it is soil density and sort of not the chemical, you know, influence. Uh, roots don't grow in soil, they grow in those pore spaces on the left around soil particles. So in that little graphic on the left, what is happening is that is a well aerated soil that has good gas exchange with the atmosphere. You can see that oxygen from above the soil line is allowed to come down through that soil and in integrate in there in the root system, supporting the root and supporting the biomass and the carbon dioxide that is given off by that root system is allowed to work through that soil and escape back into the atmosphere. So that biomass and that plant root are just like us. We take in oxygen, we give off CO2, and that is allowed to complete that cycle. On the right, when we have that compacted soil, oxygen is bouncing off. It can't get into the soil carbon dioxide that is being exuded from that root system is now trapped down there in those dense soil and can't escape. So that quickly goes from aerobic to anaerobic and then the problems result. The first change that you can see is the difference in the root system. The root system, instead of being long and fibrous, now has become shorter, thicker, and clubby. That short, thick turf grass root system can't take up moisture, can't take up nutrients in the same way that that should be when it was genetically, uh, you know, long and thin and fibrous. So that change in the grass root has been done to mimic those indicator weeds of compaction. Um, we all know broadleaf plantain. Um, I was involved in the project in Annapolis of the conversion of the state house grounds and we're in the middle of a you know transition to organic and plantain you know was everywhere so it's a big problem it's hugely compacted hadn't been aerated for 10 or 15 years but when you take a rosette of plantain and pull it out of the ground and shake it off you'll see one root that comes right out from the base of that rosette that's just about the size of my little finger and then a bunch of horizontal roots that are about that long that are about the thickness of a piece of yarn. So the entire root system of that broadleaf plantain is in the top inch or inch and a half of the soil. So therefore, that's nature's erosion control that it put there because it can tolerate tight, dense, compacted soils. So when turf grass goes into decline, this weed comes in to take its place in the system. We did a sports field years ago that was 35% broadleaf plantain. It was a mess. And it wasn't even organic at the time. It was just a, a neglected field that hadn't had anything done to it. So we came in with an organic program that involved aeration. 
and top dressing with compost and overseeding and organic fertilizer. It was back in the early years. It was not even a highly sophisticated organic program. But the one thing that it had was aggressive aeration. And it took 14 months, and that 35% plantain was gone. You could not find a rosette of plantain on that football field. Because over time, we systematically changed that soil to be able to support the grass. And then through overseeding and aggressive supporting of the grass, we were able to discourage the weed. Broadleaf plantain, as we know, is a perennial weed from seed, not from root subdivision. And as we filled those bare areas where the plantain used to be uh, with grass seed, now there was nowhere left for that new seed to germinate and cause a problem. So when we're talking about ourselves, what can we go without the longest? We can go without food for three weeks, water for three days, air for three minutes, and grass is exactly the same. You can stop fertilizing it, you can stop watering it, and for the most part, it will not die. Uh, and, but if you rob that root system of oxygen, the plant is in trouble. So we have these three things. No amount of ir herbicide, irrigation, fertilizer, or grass seed will have a lasting effect until we reverse the problem of compaction. So what we're seeing there in the picture is not the problem, that's the symptom. The problem underlying is compaction. A 7% uh, increase in soil density creates a 90%, 98% decrease in water infiltration. So the more compact it gets, the harder it is for water to move into the system. So compaction equates with weeds, drought intolerance, and lower energy reserves. Uh, this is your fescue grasses. Uh, for you know, Bermuda grass, it would be not those two growing seasons, but one big growing season. But the same underlying principle is the same whether it's Bermuda or fescue. At the highest heat times of the year, if we have a very compacted soil, the translocation of heat through that soil is greater. So the more compact soil is, the, f the deeper and at the higher temperatures heat is conducted into that soil environment. And at some point, even for warm season grasses, that soil gets sufficiently hot enough to compromise you know, growing portions of the plant. So the effects of compaction, root mass goes down, water infiltration goes down, Drought tolerance goes down, energy reserves go down, weeds go up, disease goes up, and if it's an athletic field, believe me, injuries go up. So, you know, if we've got a school district or a municipality that is aerating once a year, it might as well not even bother. When you mechanically aerate a turf system that's heavily used, the benefits of aeration last for three to five weeks. The counterpoint to that is an earthworm tunnel that lasts for three years of keeping that channel open and viable to introduce oxygen and nutrient and water. So the benefit of aeration is, is, is fleeting at best. So when we're talking about trying to manage organically uh, playing fields, we're talking about three, four, five times a year aerating because we know that compaction is going to cause a lot of problems that we no longer have the product tools to take care of. Um, this is a, uh, this picture got out of whack, out of line. Let me get back to where I want to be. Athletic field. This is a baseball field and a field hockey field in this orientation. So heavily, heavily used in, in uh, the middle of August all the way through November with field hockey. Field hockey, very tough sport uh, on the uh, on grass. Uh, as, you, as you see, a touch of clover in the front of this field, um, but no broadleafed weed whatsoever. And we have that kind of weed pressure that's on that field also. And you see broadleaf plantain, you see knotweed, you see very little grass. This is the field hockey goalmouth, where it's compacted because they have a girl standing from August to November. So the aeration that it takes to relieve the rest of the field wasn't sufficient enough to do that, and all that weed pressure came from April 15th to the 4th of July in one spring because that is the only group of plants that nature was going to allow to grow on that site. So this was in a town that didn't allow much like Tacoma Park, did not allow 
uh, the use of synthetic products. So I had to go back to the drawing board on this one. This became a challenge. We had to reverse all of that and aggressive aeration and seeding, and it, and it took some time to, you know, to reverse that. Uh, this is what it looks like when we pull you know, aeration as a core uh, to introduce, as I say, and that's a short-lived process. Um, Paul Sachs. Paul Sachs, is, I attribute this quote to him, that uh, infusion of new seed into existing turf is, in essence, injecting youth into a natural aging process. So he owns a company in Vermont called North Country Organics. Uh, if you ever had any interest in learning about any of the organic inputs, uh, he has a technical bulletin that he puts on his website. His website is norganics.com, and he, for a long time, has been sort of you know, a good, good friend, and he's been looked at as been the guy that's created a resource of just vast amounts of organic uh, material education. Uh, we're talking about overseeding heavily, and this is for cool season turf grasses. Warm season grasses are another situation. We look at each of the species of warm season grass, and some of them are overseeded, some of them are sprigged, some of them are sodded. So again, working with the grass. But if we're managing fescue down here, uh, you know, we want to uh, overseed at least in the first couple of years of an organic program to fill any voids, fill any bare spots, get grass growing, again, because we uh, you know, are subscribing to the principle that a healthy, vigorously growing turf system, uh, when properly managed, exhibiting good nutrition, is not going to let uh, excessive weed pressures uh, get out of control. Doesn't happen overnight, it's part of a process, but we always have our eye on that end result when we can step back and look at that turf system, you know, and not have, you know, not have those weeds. When we are overseeding, uh, not anything that's organic versus chemical, but we all know that seed to soil contact is the most important thing. So the idea that if we have a heavily compacted soil and just throw grass seed on it, in all likelihood, we're not going to experience good results. Uh, early fall, mid-fall is the season to overseed. I think when we did the state house the last time, it was sort of around the third week of September. Um, you know, lo lo spring days are good for weeds. Fall days are good for grass. Uh, new construction in cool season grasses should only happen in the fall. Uh, if we have to do a construction process in the spring, <clears throat> we probably should consider using a placeholder grass uh, until we can get to the fall uh, and we can have a better chance to germinate and, and establish the, uh, the legitimate uh, the cool season grasses. Um, endophytically enhanced seed, we talked about that. Thatch, thatch is, is not, you know, generally with fescue, unless it's totally mismanaged and totally, uh, you know, uh, devoid of microbial life, you're probably never going to have a real thatch problem with that. This is more a bluegrass thing, more something like at Soccerplex where they're managing some bluegrass fields. Um, you know, it's a Bermuda, it's a bluegrass type of a thing. But thatch is that buildup of dead grass and roots. Uh, it's not clippings. So the idea that we're putting clippings on there uh, does not uh, cause this problem. It can make it worse. This is a picture where the soil doesn't have a lot of roots in there. There's not a lot of microbial life in there. It's been compromised by a lot of mineral salts over the years, and those bright white structures that are going horizontally there are the rhizomes or the reproductive structures of the Kentucky bluegrass. So now we just simply have roots and reproductive structures going left to right instead of going down in the soil. And as you can see with the necrotic tissue up above on the grass plant, you know, the system is beginning to shut down. So we, you know, there's a process that happens of dethatching with a mechanical piece of equipment. A lot of the work that we're doing now organically is to biologically dethatch. So we're using the introduction of saprophytic biological organisms that are going to dissolve the thatch from the top down. Also looking at biological organisms to aerate for us. And there's, you know, there's... Harvard University did some research and uh, clearly showed that they took a com very compacted area of campus and uh, within a year with an aggressive biological program, 
uh, they couldn't get down two inches in the beginning and got down eight inches after a year with no mechanical intervention. Uh, the culmination of my last two years of one of my research trial sites was no aeration whatsoever, and we loosened soil from three to four inches down to nine. <clears throat> and we did it all biologically without mechanical intervention. So that's a concept that is good, you know, for big picture work. Uh, you know, municipalities and school districts and playing fields because it may make it easier, you know, to aerate or, or to keep it aerated. But most importantly, I think it's an important tool for the homeowner or even, the, you know, for the landscape contractor. Anytime you can aerate, it's advantageous as an upsell. Um, you know, it, it brings revenue to the bottom line. So if you have a client that will allow you, with re to, you know, to, to, to aerate once a year and you can get that revenue, then that, that's a, it's always beneficial and it always moves things in the right direction. But if it's a do-it-yourself homeowner or, you know, a landscape contractor where maybe on a particular client the budget isn't there to allow for that, what we're trying to do is to develop the biological aspects of this program to simplify organic management and know with confidence that we can loosen and biologically aerate soils without involving the expense of aerating or for the homeowner, you know, having to go to a Home Depot or a rental agency and put an aerator in the back of a, a vehicle and, and to struggle with that heavy piece of equipment. So the idea that, you know, simplifying organic lawn care for the do-it-yourselfer and eliminating some of the struggles with heavy pieces of equipment. That's bluegrass, and that's the kind of thatch that got pulled out of there, you know, in a relatively short time. But that's genetics of the plant. The genetics of the plant, uh, you know, dictate that that's really what ends up happening. Uh, let's see, we did all of that. The last few slides, you know, in this is, is sort of this, this fungal issue that I talked about. You know, the idea that we can begin to mitigate, you know, fungal pressures without, you know, specific product intervention, you know, labeled as a fungicide. So this was a trial site that we did, and it was organic and uh, it was one where volunteers had done the mowing, and then that got to be, you know, too much. So we hired a landscape contractor, a, a fellow that was just learning the business and really didn't know anything about organic. And so we, we said, well, it's August. It's going to be hot. So, in the, it, you know, say around the 4th of July, we said, well, for the summer, you know, nobody's going to be at this trial site. There's going to be some education classes happening here in September. So just, you know, just sort of, you know, status quo for the summer, let it come up to three, three and a half, four inches, uh, and, and just, you know, be for the heat of the summer, and then we'll start to address it after Labor Day. Well, th this is, uh, is, is a town that's right on the coast in coastal Massachusetts, and what happens up there, and probably very similar to coastal areas here, is you can get clouds that hang right on the coast, but if you travel inland, you know, 15 or 20 miles, it's bright and sunny. So that's what happened in this August. I think 25 of the 31 days were cool or damp or drizzly with just these coastal clouds. When inland, it was 75 degrees and sunny. So remember I said that we have environmental stressors, and all we can do is react to them. So the fellow that was cutting this grass was not a seasoned horticulturist. He was not a seasoned you know, landscape professional. So he continued in this adverse weather condition to keep the grass at four inches. Now, when we know about fungicides and fungal diseases, the first rule in an IPM program, the first thing, the IPM protocol in the decision-making process is to try all the strategies to mitigate the problem before you reach for product. So we know that for fungal diseases, good airflow is critical. Sanitation is critical. So if it was in the greenhouse and I had a fungal issue, I would spread my plants further apart to get more air moving. If it's a turf grass system, I would cut that four inches down to two or two and a half to let air move around the crown of the grass plant. And at least if it was wet, I had free airflow moving around there so that I wasn't getting the development of a fungal pathogen. So this landscape contractor had no idea. I, I wasn't keeping track of him, and then all of a sudden I happened to walk on the site and see all of that, you know, all of that type of damage. 
Um, no product went into it. Grass simply got cut to two inches. All of that dead material, you know, got raked out of there. We put about a quarter of an inch, eighth to a quarter of an inch of compost on top of that system and introduced some new grass seed. And we had that in about three weeks. I had that in five weeks, and then that was at seven weeks when we put it to bed for the winter. Fungicide wouldn't have even have done that for me. Fungicide might have arrested the fungal pathogen, but we stopped the fungal pathogen with the beneficial microbes in the compost and then the introduction of the grass seed rejuvenated and returned the system back all at the same time when that pathogen was being suppressed by the microbial community. So that's the kind of way that we end up looking at mitigating fungal pressures without the use of a fungicide. So now the most last couple of slides in this, and then I'll show you a, a case study, and then we'll just throw it open for questions for, for the last bit. Um, this is critical. So when, you know, because we're organic doesn't mean we're not trying to manage to high expectations. Um, I'm currently managing 14 parks for the National Park Service organically. I couldn't get by if I wasn't trying to meet some communicated set of expectations for them. It, it's not the kind of a thing we can just say, well, it's organic, you get what you get. You know, we've just finished three. We started off out in the Midwest region. It, it, it started right here in Washington at, at um, the offices on I Street, and it became the Midwest Region Turf Stewardship Project. And we had three park sites out in the Midwest. I had uh, Fort Scott National Historic Site, which is a, a mid-1800s fort. I had Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And then... Um, <clears throat> Herbert Hoover's birth and burial site and presidential library in West Branch, Iowa. And you know, we learned, you know, and then that was for a three-year period, and then it became so successful and, and it caught on so fast that three all of a sudden unofficially grew to 12, 13, 14. And now the National Park Service has me going around the country and I'm training park employees nationwide on sustainable practices because they've decided that this is something that they want to incorporate, you know, into the system. But if we were trying to do this and not managing to expectations, so I had that site in, in Kansas, the fort, where I had my trial site, and the four-step program was right here, side by side. They took a two-acre parade ground, drew a line right down the middle. You work on that side, we keep the four-step program on that side. After two years in the program, the end result was they're identical. The organic site is no worse than the four-step program. Out in the Midwest, there's all kinds of weed pressures that even 2,4-D doesn't touch all the time. Um, and you know there was a few weeds came through on the organic site, but the same weeds came through on the conventional site. So side by side, you know we held our own with the four-step program under really adverse weather, soil, and environmental conditions. Uh, in West Branch, Iowa, at uh, the presidential burial site, so right there where President and Mrs. Hoover, uh, where, where the, the, the actual grave site, the end result that after two years of the three-year program, we had pushed roots from four inches to nine inches. We had taken turf density from 85% to 99%. Uh, weed pressures went down to less than 1%, and the overall, uh, the overall, um, analysis by park staff was it has never looked so good to the point that regular visitors from the area that would go into the area to to picnic and it's just a big 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 area uh, would say what's happening differently here now it just looks different so the idea that we can go in and manage at that level earlier that's exactly what I said there's not just one organic land care program we are going to manage to your communicated expectations. So when a client communicates to you what their expectation is, and every client's different, not every client wants or needs or has to have 100% monoculture of turf grass, you know, 365 days a year. For some, absolutely they do. And I have those people that I work with. I mean, I've had the gun cocked and put right to my head and said, you know, if it's not like that, you know, you're, you're in problem. So when I do these transition things, they've just given me the state house in Boston. Chemlon's done it for the last 12 years. Now they've asked me to transition it to organic. The gun's at my head. I know the gun's at my head because they're going to look at it. 
and they're going to look at every single you know day and week and month. But we know we can do it because they've communicated the expectations to us, and it's the development of the program that's going to meet that communicated expectations. So if I go in there with a low level of inputs and, and say, oh, I'll do it for you for 10 cents and I'm not going to do much, and they're going to get what they pay for. But if I go in there and say, we've got existing dollars in your budget, give me those existing dollars, let me take those and rework those into an organic program that's going to address the soil and soil health and the turf grass, and you're communicating to me that you don't want it to look any different than now when Chemlon's been on there for 10 years, I can do that. But that's going to be the higher level of inputs, the higher cost, and that's what it's going to take to maintain and meet the higher level of expectations. So that's sort of how we're beginning to approach it and looking at it that you tell us what you need the organic program to do, and we can do it for you. So that's, you know, in, to the organic, you know, the landscape community, the professional landscapers. And believe me, as a 20-odd-year chemical applicator, all those years, I was so defensive. Don't you touch my chemicals. Don't take them away from me. That was my comfort level. But then when I got outside of my comfort level and said, I, I can do this. And I, back in those days, back, you know, 20 odd years ago, nobody was teaching organic. I had to learn by myself. But, it, you know, and I made the voluntary decision to get rid of my chemicals, but I was very defensive. I, because that fear of failure, and that's what it boils down to, the inherent fear of failure. If I stop, because in organic, I'm still, we're still selling product. We're still selling fertilizer. We're still selling control materials. We're still selling insecticides. We're still selling, you know, we still have some of the organic alternative herbicides, although they're not wildly 100% effective at this point. We're still selling soil building materials. There are fungicides that are regulated and, and for organic production. So material is still being, you know, run through companies and sold, but we're also selling a different knowledge base and coming out of that comfort zone. And I did it. I, I stepped outside of my comfort zone and said there has to be a way that we can make this system actually do this. So that's what that's really the message to to the, to the you know the homeowners you guys can do it but you know to the industry it's an opportunity for revenue it's not going to be a negative to revenue because you're still going to be selling the same volumes of material it's just going to be in a different framework it's just going to be from a different origin of material and it's a systems based approach that is going to allow you to meet that level of expectations by addressing you know, the three different concepts. So when we look at this and we manage to that different type of level, cultural intensity is the key. And cultural intensity is the revenue driver for the company. Um, cultural intensity is simply the amount of resources, both product and labor, that needs to be done on an annual basis to meet that communicated set of expectations. So obviously, if I'm managing a soccer field, cultural intensity is going to be a lot higher than if I'm managing a 5,000 square foot lawn. Um, you know, there's a direct relation to the amount of inputs and time required to keep in this condition to satisfy expectations. So that's really where we think. When we think about, you know, building an organic segment to a business, when we think about what we're going to do, you know, organically from the revenue thing, we're not thinking one year to one year to one year, but you're thinking about year one, but in the back of your mind, you know there's years two and years three. And if you approach it like that as a three-year investment in time and commitment to developing a sound and sensible program, then success is going to happen, revenue is going to follow, and there is no economic injury that's going to happen to an industry. Believe me, as a, as a, you know, I'm not, you know, a classroom guy. I'm not a professor. I don't sit behind a desk all day. I'm out in the field, and I'm, I'm doing this more often than I'm not. And if I thought that I was going to stand and, and talk to in my own horticulture industry and preach and talk about something that was going to cause economic injury to an industry, I wouldn't be doing it because I've made my living all my life growing something. It's just a different way of growing, a different approach, you know, and, and stepping outside of the box and, and trying to come up with these strategies that, um, that will produce the results. Let me go through this last quick uh, case study here, and then, you know, this will touch on a little bit of the, of the concept. So, you know, when we're talking about this transition uh, from chemical management, natural management, we've got some considerations up front. And, 
you know, we're going to choose the appropriate grass. So if I know somebody is not interested in high management, I'm not going to pick a high management grass. If I know that, you know, somebody really wants to have that better homes and gardens look to their front lawn, I'm not going to suggest one of these low mow fine fescues that have been developed from non-turf type cultivars, you know, of some of the sort of the native fescues that are here in the eastern seaboard. Uh, th those grasses exist. Um, they will never produce that high quality lawn. They're great for that low expectation. They're great for that low mow. Uh, and you know, you, you cut it half as much, and then when you cut it, right the day you cut it, it, l it looks nice. But then you let it grow out for a week, it gets a little clumpy, it gets a little shaggy. It's not going to produce the high level of expectation. So we begin to really look appropriately on the kinds of grasses we're using. We're using the best cultivars that we have. Uh, if we're, you know, establishing something, we're doing the best site preparation. Um, you, you know, I think you can get by what we've talked about today. Nutrition is critically important, specifically nutrition from the organic perspective that's building the soil and always helping to move that system forward, bringing in the cultural practices and bringing in the soil health practices. So in, in, in organic, like right, say right now here in Tacoma Park, un, under the statute on what you can and can't do, there's two ways that you could choose to manage. You could develop a program on an annual basis that would incorporate the use of allowed materials right up front as part of that program. So you could use a corn gluten for pre-emergence crabgrass control. Uh, that granular corn gluten now has, uh, has been refined to have a liquid version. So it's taken out the high nitrogen it's now, instead of 10% nitrogen from corn gluten, it's 1% nitrogen, but it's retained the protein that actually gives you that herbicidal property. So you could spray that twice. The most effective way to use that material is to spray it on uh, early in the season, uh, two applications 30 days apart as a pre-emergence material. So you could choose to do that. The downside of doing that is you've eliminated the opportunity to overseed with good grass because the use of pre-emergence will take out some crabgrass pressures but it will not allow a fescue grass seed to germinate. So now it's a decision. It's an either or. Um, so we could do that. You could do a, an application of a grub control uh, material, something that would be allowed. Uh, you could do a preemptive strike with, uh, with a cedar oil, uh, with a Grandivo as a just in case doesn't make any sense. It's kind of a waste of money if you don't have a grub population. Uh, you could do an inoculation of a beneficial nematode up front uh, in case a grub, you know, ended up, you know, being there from a beetle egg. But again, it's expensive and it, it's a preemptive just-in-case strike. That's an example of creating an annual management program using allowed materials. Or the way that I manage is managing without pesticides and employing the rescue treatment concept. So that means that I'm going to do everything that we've talked about today in building the system, addressing the system, meeting the needs of communicating these expectations, and then if in my transition something gets out of whack, I've got an allowed list of materials that I can fall back on as a rescue treatment. It doesn't make any sense to me to incorporate control products as part of a program if they're not needed whether it's allowed material or not allowed material. So my thought for what it's worth is the second way is the more appropriate way to manage. It's the more cost effective way to manage. And then if something gets out of control and it's a skilled horticultural professional, you can react to it pretty quickly and bring things under control. Uh, managing with allowed products. So what you have allowed for you here is the list of US EPA 25B minimum risk pesticides, which is a group of active ingredients that the US EPA has uh, exempted from the registration process because they have been determined to be uh, not of toxicological uh, concern to the environment or to human health. Uh, at some point, probably in the next five years, you will see this group of 25B regulated to some extent, but still will be allowed material. We have horticultural oils and soaps. Believe me, if you are managing ornamentals in a landscape, 
you can manage 95% of the insect problems with horticultural oils. When I eliminated uh, insecticides from my greenhouse, I fell back onto horticultural oils, and I was able to keep things at threshold levels very, very easily. You, you talked about that, that, you know, that it, and, and that's what good IPM is. IPM, Integrated Pest Management, is adopting acceptable threshold levels. Gone are the days when you got to bring out the nuclear arsenal to get everything at zero. That's just old time stuff. You know, we have acceptable threshold levels, and that's what we, ma that's how we manage. Biological organisms, these are some of the, you know, bacillus or the fungal organisms that are OMRI approved, that are allowed, and th that's the new, that's the bacillus thuringiensis, that's that grandivo, that's these things that have, are biological in nature that have OMRI certification that, honestly, they work as effectively as the others. They just, it's different chemistry, different technology, different science, but they work. Uh, so we end up having that. Here is a list of the EPA 25B exempt. Uh, there's material on here that has fungicidal properties, insecticidal properties. Uh, there's some here that have non-selective weed control that would be used in formulations and combinations to become the Roundup alternatives. Uh, there's a couple on here that have uh, some degree of non-selective turf grass control that have been developed into, you know, into, uh, you know, materials. So the bottom line is we have a, have a bunch of stuff that can be fallen back on if needed. Most important thing when we're doing and managing is site assessment and evaluation. AMP can't develop a program without that. Uh, we under need to understand the plant as, the, you know, the genetics of the plant. Uh, right species for the right location, all grass isn't created equal, warm, <laughs> cool season grass is always the right grass for the right place. As a society, we have been horribly guilty of forcing grass where it doesn't belong. We are, we're growing grass in places where grass has no business growing. And when we do that, it gets to be a problem. And when it gets to be a problem, what happens? We reach for something as a, as a control. So it's putting the right plant in the right place. I'm sure all you folks are dealing with grasses and residential landscapes that you sit there. Every time you go on the property, you say, why in the world did anybody ever put grass here? And that's just a struggle. Um, it's not always the appropriate plant. Soils, getting it right in the beginning and new construction. Um, you know, many, many systems fail because of inadequate strategies up front. So here we have a case study. You can see this, again, the, the washout here is, is, is a little bit, but a lot of weed pressure. This is probably 75% weed pressure if we put it on a weed grid, uh, even in areas up to the right there would be close to 100%. Um, you know, here is different close-ups of all of the weeds. There's the crabgrass there. There's the monoculture of, of clover in here. So just a challenging, totally neglected 25-year-old Kentucky bluegrass system. Different mowing heights here on the left. Uh, two, three, and four inches. Uh, the picture top right and bottom left just shows you how careful you need to be with municipal compost. That's the kind of weeds that can come in a municipal compost. The compost was mature, so there was no weed seed in there from the composting process, but they stored it out in the back 40 where they never cleaned the perimeter of the area, and pigweed and all these other weeds went up and then went to seed, and the seed blew onto the compost pile, and then when they moved the pile, incorporated all the seed and ended up with a horrible material. Uh, this shows the bottom right. That happens to be Kentucky bluegrass, but just showing the aggressive nature of the reproductive structures of the grass. Uh, here's some pictures of clover mitigation with the mineral salts and a chelated iron, so a water-soluble iron uh, and a uh, mineral salt, just potassium salt so, and, uh, and, and sodium salt, sodium bicarb salt, showing that we can knock down clover and not hurt the grass. Doesn't really work on crabgrass, so there isn't a su successful selective post-emergence on crabgrass. Bottom right, just to show you that this material has a punch to it, this was done on purpose to show that you can't use these materials in hot temperatures. So warm temperatures, it, up, up top, they were done in cool temperature, didn't hurt the grass, uh, took out the clover. Bottom right, warm temperature, didn't kill the grass, cosmetic blemish on the grass that lasted for four weeks, didn't kill the crown, the grass came back, but not an acceptable situation. Uh, then grubs were identified in the system. These are all the telltale signs. 
opened up the system, found seven on the surface. Had we gone down six or seven inches, probably would have found four or five more. Threshold being eight to 10 per square foot for treatment. I chose not to treat. So I had seven on the surface, and let's say I had 12 to 14 in my square foot down to a depth of six inches. I decided I wasn't gonna treat because I wanted to try to show that I could let those grubs stay there, and as long as I addressed the nutritional needs of the turf grass and, and, and was proactive, that I'd just let those grubs be there and aerate for me, and I wasn't even gonna focus on them. I wasn't gonna panic. So that's what we did. We didn't panic, and um, we turned it into that. I wish we had a, a better uh, a visual of it. Uh, this shows the uh, top left is a weed that was in the compost, but top right is a dandelion being suppressed by aggressive turf growth. Bottom left is loose soil down to nine inches with no mechanical aeration. That was all done biologically. Uh, over here on the right is the bottom side of that, and you can see in the middle of the picture that root. So we actually have roots. That, that's, uh, that's nine inches on the, on the wedge there, and probably that root would stretch out to 11 or 12. So that loosening of the soil happened <coughs> without mechanical aeration. And then this was the finished product where we have that turf system there and all the close-ups. The weeds are gone, the broadleaf is gone, the crabgrass is gone. This was a 14, 15 month trial that went from 70% weeds to, you know, we'll, we'll say that we've got maybe 2% in there. If we are managing chemically, if any municipality has a contract that goes out for chemical management of public spaces, that contract usually has language in there to say that our tolerance level is 5% weed pressure because we all know that even the conventional industry, you know, doesn't, can't make the claim that it's 100% weed free 100% of the time with chemicals. So that's the language that's usually in there. 5% is the acceptable level. We are below that threshold uh, managing at, um, at uh, that level. Uh, it, uh, it's doable, not as, no longer cost prohibitive, uh, more effective uh, with, uh, with less, so nutrition. Understanding genetics, not just opening bags anymore and making applications. Good horticultural practices, approaching it as a grower of grass, getting it right, design and build. Main, you know, we, this discussion is perfect for the design industry as well. Designing a landscape to take organic management in the future, not just chemical management. Success can be experienced. So what would an organic program look like? If we were going to sit down and design a program from day one to manage a system in transition, so let's make the assumption that it's like that state house in Boston where it's coming off of multiple years of water-soluble synthetic management for both fertility and control. What are we going to do? Well, we already know from our talk you know, today that we're going to address the soil first. So the most important thing up front is to address the soil. But you can't just address the soil and let the grass fall by the wayside. So we're going to be addressing it at those two levels. So if we, we do our soil test, and we let that soil test tell us if we've got any deficiencies that we need to correct. So if we're deficient in phosphorus, our first fertilizer application by law here in Maryland can contain phosphorus. If we have adequate phosphorus, then the entire turf grass program becomes zero phosphorus. And that's the way it should be. I mean, even in states where there is no phosphorus legislation, there just is not a need. And phosphorus in turf grass is, it's involved in different physiological functions within the grass, but most noticeably for the, for the root development, initial root development. But I just told you how I did a Kentucky bluegrass thing this fall with zero phosphorus in the start of fertilizer, but I used my bacterial organisms as phosphorus solubilizers to release the phosphorus that was already in the soil, and I... I took that turf grass system, that bluegrass, and I grew the seams together in nine days. And uh, 18 days after I laid it down, I couldn't pull it back up again. And that was with no phosphorus. And uh, at that point, it was a half a pound of nitrogen to start. And then right after that, it got another four tenths, so nine tenths of a pound of nitrogen. Within 30 days, you would have thought that lawn had been there for five years. So. What we're going to do is, in my opinion, the best organic lawn care programs are combinations of liquid and granular. 
if we have only the ability to deliver granular and we don't have the ability to deliver liquid, we can still certainly do it. And what we are going to be looking at is granular fertilizer applications. Uh, this would be for years one and two. I generally try to keep the program constant for two years, and then I decide at the end of two years what modifications or adjustments I may need to make. So we would be doing granular fertilizers. Let's say that Maryland law says you can't put down any more than 3.2 pounds of nitrogen in a year. We're going to say three pounds to meet the highest level of expectations. Three pounds of organic nitrogen is a lot of organic nitrogen. You may have heard that it takes more nitrogen organically than synthetically, because that's why it costs so much more. But one pound of nitrogen organically is equal to a pound and three quarters synthetic, because it's extended. It works differently, so it's a different mechanism, a different mode of action. So if we were doing the old days of five one-pound applications of soluble nitrogen, synthetically, I still would only be doing three to counteract the five, and I would still be equal across the board. So that's the mechanics on how it cumulatively works in a season, because it builds upon itself. So early in the spring, remembering that, you know, that, that you need warmer soils. So in order for organic fertilizers to be rapidly successful, you need soil temperatures of 50 degrees. So soil thermometer tells you everything you need to know. So when soil temperatures get to be about 48 degrees, you put down a granular organic fertilizer. I never put down more than three quarters of a pound of insoluble nitrogen at a time. Now, Maryland state law says that you can't put down more than nine-tenths of a pound of actual nitrogen, and only seven-tenths of that can be soluble. If I'm using a granular organic, 100% is water insoluble at a rate of three quarters of a pound, 1,000 per application. I'm going to do that in, uh, at some point in early spring. I'm going to follow that up in early to mid-June. I'm going to then come back and do that uh, in late August or early September. And then I'm going to follow that up around the 1st of October. Three quarters of a pound at each application. And then that will give me my nutritional base for nitrogen. Uh, if I'm using a granular, I'm going to probably try to get my potassium to be three-quarters or one-to-one -to, -one to nitrogen. So a great organic formulation is a 606 because it brings both nitrogen and potassium to the table. Uh, there's, there's also, if we have enough potassium in soil and if we need to cut budget and we got corners, they, they're now making a 601 and an 801 uh, great fertilizers based on soy uh, when we don't need the potassium in the system and we're looking to save 15% on the cost of the fertilizer. We probably would use a product similar to something called GVH, granulated uh, vermicompost with humates. Uh, that can be, uh, th that's one product. There's another product called Humamend, which is an insoluble humate uh, with some soluble humate added. And that can go down, that can go down somewhere between 10 and 15 pounds, 1,000 square feet, not an expensive material. Uh, that's something that could go down any time in the season. You, down here, you do not want to stimulate with nitrogen in July and August to any great degree. So that if you're looking to be on a property, you know, five times a year, that would be the perfect application for that July application because it's strictly soil building. So that's giving you the humates, that's giving you some nutrition from that vermicompost. Uh, a little bit goes a long way, and I think 50 pounds of that stuff still delivered is only about $20 a bag or a box, however they're packaging it now. So that would be sort of an all granular program. If we were doing a combination of granular and liquid, and we had the ability to deliver liquids, we can be a lot more flexible, and we can be a lot more creative. There is a, a new, uh, as I mentioned, that new nitrogen from amino acid, uh, micronized soy protein uh, that comes in a 50-pound bag. Uh, the 50-pound bag costs about $320. That 50-pound bag will fertilize four acres. A right? little bit goes a long way. We're using it at one, two, three, four weighed ounces, 1,000 square feet per application, depending upon what we're trying to do. So if we were doing a combination of liquid or granular program, I have two options. One, 
I could come by with this soy uh, protein all by itself, this nitrogen all by itself at a rate of four ounces. And when I talk about four ounces of powder, I'm talking about four weight ounces. Four ounces, 1,000 square feet, which translates to 0.48 pounds of nitrogen, so under a half a pound of nitrogen. That all by itself liquid would be my first application. That's going to give me my quick green up if that's really what I'm after. And then the rest of the program develops after that. If I'm willing to say that that fast, you know, that, that quick shot of nitrogen for green up isn't important, which I don't think it is, so I don't base my programs on that, but the, a, a typical, for, so that, that's sort of the special conditions, that if you have that situation that, that you just really need to think that you got to get there to get that shot up front, that's an option. A more broad program would be first application, 606 or 601 or 801, that soybean organic fertilizer at a rate of three quarters of a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet would be your first application. And that would happen, you know, as soil temperatures got to be the upper 40s. Then second application and third application would be both liquid applications. They might look something like incorporating this soy, uh, this soy amino acid at three tenths, four tenths of a pound of actual nitrogen. So we're still going to go for that highest level of expectations of three pounds of nitrogen. So if I get three quarters of a pound from, you know, there, then I know that I've got room to play and I can juggle. I have an option also of coming back in early September with a second granular. Again, a lot of it becomes budget, a lot of it cost, what you buy in fertilizer for, you know, how far you have to ship it, what the cost is. So then my first application is the granular. Second and third would become liquid. That liquid application could either have compost tea as a base or just straight water. So if you have the option of having compost tea, great. If you don't, it's not a limitation. We, I would put in my tank uh, four tenths of a pound of nitrogen, so that's four ounces of this amino acid soy protein. I would put four liquid ounces of kelp. I would put four liquid ounces of humic acid. Uh, and I would put in uh, uh, one ounce of uh, molasses. That would be for every thousand square feet that I am trying to treat. So then you have your spray tank, then you calculate, you know, the size of the tank and, you know, the size of the property, but that's sort of those are the raw material inputs. In that first application in transition, um, there are biological. So I'm going to make the assumption that we're not spending the $250 to do a bioassay on all the properties. So I might have great biology, I might have so-so biology. But let's say that I am going to say that it, bank on the fact that it's so-so. So I want to jump start it with two things, a mycorrhizal inoculation, which isn't expensive. I mean, $100 of a mycorrhizal powder will treat two acres, you know, 90,000 square feet of turf. So it's not a high ticket item. There are plenty of biological supplements. There's one out there, and I'm not mentioning brand names because I am advocating, you know, any particular company. There just happens to be a product out there called Organic Plant Magic. These people come up with these crazy names. I know people, I swear, stay up all night long to think of names of all these things. But it's just a biological, a consortium of microbes that builds the system. And I just happen to have used that product. So I'm going to put that. It's, it's a powder that's reconstituted in a liquid solution. So now my first and second liquid applications that are going to happen down here probably in May and then the end of June. And a lot of it depends on how many times you want to be on the property a year as a practitioner. Do you want to be on two times, three times, four times, five times? So then we can play with concentrations and delivery and rates, and, and we can do cumulative loads or break it down. Into, so that becomes an individual company's discussion. But the second and third applications would, would contain some combination of these materials. Mycorrhizae, biological stimulus, th that mycorrhizal, that, that sets the system up for good. You're done. So two times, one and done. You're out. You don't have to do it again. Again, the, bio, the, the, the biological stimulants uh, or, or, or additives, again, don't have to be done all the time. Then I'm not going if if, you know, to, then if I want to be on the property, so that's one, two, three applications, 
Now, if I want to be on five times, and a lot of practitioners do want to be on five times, um, I have the option of doing two in the fall or one in the summer that has no nitrogen, just soil building, and one in the fall. So that becomes sort of your decision on what you want to do. If you want to be on there once in the summer and have eyes on the property and sell that as part of your service, then that's the time when you're going to put just biological materials, just the kelp, just the humic acid, just the biological stimulants in there to build the soil. You're not going to put nitrogen, although if you use that soy protein, you could get by with one or two tenths of a pound of nitrogen without an adverse stimulus in hot weather. Then you would do an application in the fall, and if we're going to be on there once in the fall, it could be one granular at three quarters of a pound of nitrogen. It could be one liquid, or sometimes we go in and do granular and liquid on the same day. You've got the crew there. They run through with the spreader and drop down the, the granular at a half to three quarters of a pound, and then follow it up right at the same time with a liquid. Then what we did at the State House was we tagged one on at the end of the season, like October 1st to 10th because you still get a lot of growing season between the 1st of October and the end of the season, and that's just addressing the roots. Not really looking at the cosmetic benefit of the grass at that point, just looking to drive that root system down. So you can see there's a lot of creativity with organic programs now, so different than it used to be, but that's kind of what typical programs you, you know, could look like. And believe me, I've costed them out because I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not in any situation where there's any money extra to do this, whether it's municipal, the National Park Service, we're on a shoestring budget. I mean, it just is crazy. We, I had to do one where we did three acres. Had, they said, okay, we want to do a program on three acres, but we only have $500. But we did it. You know, we did something that made a benefit. So that's, you know, sort of the way that we can look at this. Lots of creativity as you begin to learn, as you begin to get the science. And the bottom line is that it all fits in. We easily, with these programs, fall into the product to labor ratio, what you need for markups. The cost of this stuff now is at a point that you can maintain, maintain margins across the board. You don't have to sacrifice margins you know, in order to, to make the programs work. You know, so that being said, um, we covered a lot. I know we did. And, um, you know, not a lot of specific on insect, weed, and disease, but as I said, I'm here uh, always available to answer questions, uh, you know, after, after today. But for now, let me throw it open to see if, um, you know, anybody here has any specific questions on something that you may have experienced or that, uh, that I talked about. Any questions? I was just wondering, was there an ideal percentage of organic matter in the composition of soil? I thought you said 5%. But. 5 percent is on average, and 5 percent is very good. Um, you know, ideally, again, thinking of organic matter as the home for the microbes, ideally, if we could get to 6 or 7, somewhere between 6 and 7.5, and we'd be home free. Um, when you look at design specifications, for new construction, particularly athletic fields, recommendations are to try to establish in the beginning at that range. But it's not always practical or not always sustainable from the point of view of budget or, or other things. But yeah, I mean, if you can get between five and seven, it's great. But if it's at five or below, well, we manage it that way. That's when some of these products that tweak the humic portion, like the humates, become very critical. Um, for cool season grasses, um, any recommendations for overseeding to prevent crabgrass? Do you have a rate or a range? Well, you don't use a whole lot of perennial ryegrass down here because it, uh, you know, is one. Although we did, we did introduce perennial ryegrass to the state house this year because it's fast germinating. So, you know, when we look at the cool season grasses, perennial ryegrass germinates in, at, at soil temperatures of 50 degrees, 50 to 55. Perennial ryegrass germinates in seven to 10 days. Kentucky bluegrass, 21. Fescue, somewhere in the middle, 12, 10, 12, 10 to 14. So if we are early spring 
and we want to fill a bare spot before a weed gets there, and it's cooler temperatures. Perennial ryegrass is still a good grass to try to use here. I'm not going to go out in July and try to seed it down here, but I can get by with it in the springtime to fill a bare spot before a weed gets here, and that's what we did at the State House. We went with a complete 100% try rye even though it's not recommended down here and had great success. But we followed it up with the fescue. So that is what that does. If we are seeding in early June or early September, then we can go with fescue because you have plenty of time to allow it to, to go through the germination and establishment phase. So it, up beyond those windows of 7 to 10, 10 to 12, and 21 days, you have an establishment period that's equally as long or even a little bit longer. So in the spring, it's just a foot race between grass and weeds. Any questions? What, what do you know about our locally available compost leaf grow? Because we use it a lot for overseeding. Are you familiar I'm with that product? Familiar, I've never it's, used it. It's made by, I believe, an organization, a government organization, I think. It's, it's retrieved leaves and grass clippings from the community. And then a private organization, I think, creates it and bags it. We've had success with it, but I, I don't know if you've heard anything about it or if, if I it's, have. Yeah, if it's I a have. good thing to use the way we're using it. Because yeah, I believe the company that makes that does two different products, and one is biosolid in nature, but leaf grow is not. Right? Is that the way? Right there? And yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. That that material that you know five ten years ago everybody would turn their nose up at it, and now we're looking at that as being highly desirable material, especially in that overseeding type of a thing. It just makes that the biological interaction between the microbes there, the system, and the new grass seed just make everything happen more effectively and faster. So that is a good product. Yes. Yeah, I had a question about the Maryland Nutrient Management Laws. I know that there's a blackout date uh, from November 15th to November 30th. You can apply fast-release fertilizer up to half a pound of N per thousand. H how do you deal with that since organics are banned during that time? We're generally not fertilizing at all after. The, for me, you know, the sort of November 15th down here is the end line. Back up north in my region, New England, uh, it's Halloween. So after Halloween, we're not because with organic uh, soil temperature going back to that. So we know that as soil temperature is going down, microbes are much less active. When microbes are less active, basically it just becomes a waste of money with fertilizer. So what we're doing is we're looking at, and this is a school of thought from some cooperative extensions, is that when you are preconditioning a turf system for winter, that preconditioning starts in Labor Day. So, you know, that that's when you really begin to look long term. You know, late fall fertilization with synthetics was developed by the industry really as a way to move more product later in the season. And, you know, did a lot of trials that showed that you got some root development late in the season without stimulating excessive top growth. But, you know, when I look at management as a grower of the crop, you know, I've always, we've all been taught that April or March is the beginning of the grass growing season. I tend to look at Labor Day as the beginning of the grass growing season, and my big push and my big focus and concentration is September, October, and early November, and then what I do in March, April, May, and June is a continuation of what I put in place in the fall. So a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking, but with organics, uh, we're generally saying November 15th is the end line with no fertility delivery after that. Yeah, thanks. Just a quick follow-up. Yeah, we, we've always, I think, considered um, the growing season for turf to be kind of between August 15th. Yeah, that's great. And, that's and, exactly and, what uh, And December 1st. And um, I think it's interesting that you're talking about early spring green-up. And we, we just see our lawns are really, they don't require really much or any fertilizer in the spring. Oh, I agree 100%. We're fertilizing them correctly in the fall. Yep. So, you know, we have limited time to do our applications. And every day you take away from us, is a day we can't do production. So the question right. is, who do we lay off and which customers do we disappoint? Yeah, yeah. No, you're spot on. That's exactly right. And I, you know, I only bring it up because it's one of the things that when I talk about transition that, you know, is, is I get, you know, audience all the time and say, you know, I have to be, you know, and that, and it just becomes that thing that, you know, we now just, I, I never used to even mention this, but now I, I do because it's one of those things that when I train, 
especially, so when I do trainings, a lot of times I'm doing, you know, preaching to the choir. So I've got a room full of people that are already have been doing this for a number of years and want to learn more of, of the modern strategies. And then I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, a lot of times with people that have never done it or that are skeptical or that are hearing it for the first time. And, you know, the, the, when those skeptics, that's one of the first thing that always, I, one comes to mind that I did, uh, you know, back last spring when, you know, three or four people in there said, I have to get that fertilizer down every spring, you know, to get that fast green up. And my answer to them was, what's the point? You know, it's going to happen. And if we can all just be comfortable in stepping back and letting it happen, we're far better off. My question has to do with uh, the sanitation departments of some of the communities and so forth. Uh, we used to have here at Blue Plains was uh, Earth Grow. We had for a while, but then they discontinued it, I think, because of the industrial metals that uh, appeared in it. Loudoun County has one that's uh, supposedly pretty good. It's a 606 and, uh, and no, me no metals in it. I don't know if you heard, hear much about them at all. Or from the, that, that would be a, a production of wastewater management and, and like biosolid and marketing it as a fertilizer, right? So it's, it's a biosolid compost that is marketed as fertilizer. And the same thing happens back up my way. It's in Massachusetts. It's marketed as base state fertilizer. And it's, it's not, nothing, nothing more than the, you know, product of wastewater treatment for the city of Boston. Um, we don't use those. You know, we... Even though they test out, you know, at lower heavy metals than they may have in the past, for many people, one of the concerns, and the U.S. EPA acknowledges this, can't really test for it yet, but is residual pharmaceuticals that pass through the process. So that, you know, we know that birth control, we know that chemotherapy drugs, we know that antibiotics, we know that growth hormones pass through our systems and end up bound to some of the solids as the byproduct of wastewater treatment. So the fact that we are taking this material, you know, the whole discussion of, of heavy metals aside, the fact that we're taking a material where we know there's a better than even chance that there's residual pharmaceuticals in there, it just gives us cause for concern with all of the other legitimately good materials that are out there to be taking that and putting it either into an agricultural situation or into a residential situation, you know, and introducing that. So that's, you know, concern. It's, it's not regulated, you know, under statute here. But, you know, for those of us in the organic industry, it, it's a concern. So um, I know you didn't really discuss this, but as a potential customer for one of these companies, how would I know, like, what is a reasonable price and, you know, and how much would the cost go up? That would be a customer's concern if you went from the traditional conventional to going all organic. Mm -hmm. um, that would depend, you know, company to company. I mean, I would think that, you know, there are some of the programs I talked about, you know, just a, just a few minutes ago, we could probably be cost neutral to everybody except the big ones, you know, that are out there doing it where, it's, where it's a numbers game. And, you know, if they tell you $350 a year and you say it's too much money, now all of a sudden it's 300 or 275 because they want the numbers in the company. So that's the more national companies that, you know, that do that. So that, but if it is a, an independent contractor, that is doing a conventional program here that's a, you know, thoughtful, you know, good business, good, good businessman, woman, and doing a program, we could probably switch them out to an organic program that would be pretty close to cost neutral. At the utmost, you might be looking at a 15%, you know, cost increase, you know, 15, maybe 18% cost increase in year one and two with the idea that by year three, it should level itself off. Um, the other factor that figures into that is whether or not, you know, in some lawn care programs, overseeding is included as a base part of the program. In others, it's an upsell. So you have the option of, of, of getting the fertility program and maybe some control product, and then, you know, overseeding and aeration become the extras. In the programs I develop, 
I encourage the practitioners to include overseeding as part of the base program because as I mentioned, grass seed is, is my weed killer. So I'm including that in there. So five pounds per thousand of grass seed costs more than a squirt of Trimex or a Dimension or something like that. So that can be reflected in there and that's what it, that, but that's building the system up on the front side. And that's if we're including grass seed as part of the program. Compost top dressing, that would, that would make a bigger jump. You wouldn't get that in that 15% increase. That would be in order to compost top dress, any company that compost top dress by hand, meaning they were taking the compost out of a, out of a truck with a wheelbarrow and dropping pile and pile and then raking it out there, absolutely has to charge you between $120 and $150, 1,000 square feet, or they shouldn't even get out of bed in the morning to do it. And that's just the reality of what that takes. It's expensive. Does it work? Absolutely it works. Is it a huge beneficial thing? Yes, it is. But there's a price tag to it. So if you have a 5,000 square foot lawn, it's going to cost you $750 to $1,000 to get it top dressed. Two, three years down the road, is that going to make a big difference for you? And are you going to be happy you did it? Yeah. But can it be afforded up front? So that goes off the table because that's an expensive, it's an expensive thing and you can't expect any professional contractor you know, to reasonably come in and, and do it for less than that. And, you know, if, if somebody had one or 2,000 square feet, honestly, it's not worth the contractor coming in there doing it for $300. It's, it's a process, and, and, and there's a lot of work. It's labor intensive. So that you have to understand that any, you know, any, any reasonable company that's, that's a skilled professional, that's something that's going to have a price tag to it. It's above and beyond the program. Uh, you advocate soil testing initially to address deficiencies uh, in a, moving to an organic program. How often do you advocate repeating that test to see where you are ongoing managing a property over years and years? So if I am soil testing in year one and I find that things are pretty well in balance, I'm not going to retest till the beginning of year three. I'm not going to waste the time or the money. I don't need to. If I find that I have something that is out of whack, like if my pH is out of whack, and it could go either way. I could be too acidic and I need to move it to alkaline, or I could have somebody that's been doing something wrong and I could be way too alkaline and I've got to put sulfur on there to bring it back down to the right range. So if I have something that's deficient or out of whack, I would test in the beginning of year two. So I would repeat in one year to see if I made progress towards my goal. Once I got to the point of retesting at the beginning of year three, I'm pretty much done, as long as I know that I'm continuing in the same program and I understand the inputs I've put in there, there's no need to, to continue to soil test after that. Okay, it's almost four o'clock. I, I, any more questions? We can take two more, one or two more. Thank you. <laughs> just want to know about um, compost piles. Uh, is there a way to more or less soil test a compost that oh, you're absolutely. creating on your own? Can you? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. There's a, yeah, composting is a, you know, if we had more time, I'd have gone into it uh, much more. I have a certificate of technical ability in commercial composting, so that's one of my, you know, things that I'm really, you know, fond of talking about. But yeah, I mean, you can simply take a soil test of compost, and, and it's called compost chemistry. Uh, all the labs run compost chemistry tests, and that will tell you, you know, where that is in the process, if it's mature, what the carbon to nitrogen ratio is, what you've retained in there for nutrients, what the beneficial is. So that's a relatively inexpensive test to do on, on backyard composting. When I am working with compost in a big way uh, in a project and buying lots of the stuff from a commercial composter, I'm doing that test, but then I'm also doing that biological assay where I get a complete snapshot of every living thing that's in there to make sure that the, there's certain organisms that are in the beginning of a composting process and then they go into decline and other organisms take over in the process and then by the end of the process, there should be a nice balance of all the organisms. So then I'm going to test to make sure that balance is there on the end. If I'm spending thousands of dollars to buy it, I want to make sure it's biologically. But for home composting, yeah, just a simple compost chemistry will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. I'm going to jump in. 
Uh, no one asked about weed control. Um, green Kalinga, yellow nuts edge, Bermuda grass, and cool season lawns. How do you control that? Oh, you got all the biggies. That's the toughies, yeah. Um, they are, you know, that is uh, it sedge, nut sedge. I mean, even chemically, we know that we're hard pressed to find stuff that is a silver bullet, you know, for it chemically. Um, they've done some work, you know, we've, we've done some mitigation. Again, taking that, that uh, chelated iron product is injurious to nut sedge. Uh, it doesn't translocate down and, and wipe out that nutlet completely. So that's, that's a problematic. So that ends up, unfortunately, falling back to cultural practices. We know that it's moisture in soils and, you know, if the option to dry out soils. And I've got one project where as soon as we get excessive rains or irrigation goes out of whack, nut sedge blows out. Then if the rain stops or we turn the irrigation off, it, 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 it goes away. Um, so there are weeds. There are certain problem weeds. And, you know, Bermuda and Nimblewill is, is in that family. They're tough. Um, you know, we've done some injury with this combination of, of mineral salts and, and, um, and iron. Uh, those are areas where the organic industry and the research side of it still has a, has a ways to go. That, you know, not making any excuses, but there are, you know, there are situations we could sit here and find handfuls of situations uh, around, you know, specific weed issues that organically, I can't honestly tell you turf density is going to make it go away because it, it, it's not. I've tried. It, it, if I can't make it go away and after 15 years of trying, you know, it's not going to just happen overnight. So that is the, the limitation, that there's a few of the things that are out there on the fringe for weed pressures that have escaped what we have at this point for, you know, material, and, and that's where we're working. The level I'm working at is with developers and manufacturers and company to come up with, you know, materials that will be effective in a selective way against some of these, some of these things. Non-selectively, we can take care, but that's not going to help us in a lawn, and you know, and, and that's 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 sort of the gap. That's that's the one little gap in organic right now. Okay, so it's almost four o'clock. It's four or five, so I think we should like thank you everybody for coming. And thank you. You did a good job.